I often hear people say that they feel like their dog separation anxiety is somehow connected to their, I don't know, adequacy as an owner, as a guardian. And that somehow it feels like they, they're they obviously just not doing a good job of being an owner and being a guardian because their dogs ended up with separation anxiety. Well, that's why in this week's episode, I am talking to two of my certified SA Pro trainers, Beth Bacobian and Joe Sellers. Now, both Beth and Joe have been through what you're going through. They've both had dogs with separation anxiety and they've both experienced what it's like to live and train a dog with this condition. And the reason I want to talk to them is because Beth and Joe are not alone. There are plenty of dog professionals. I come across dog professionals all the time, whether that be uh, sports dogs trainers, whether that be um, pet dog trainers. I come across so many dog professionals who have experienced having a dog of their own have this condition. And I want you to hear what they have to say about it, what Beth and Joe have to say about it, so that you know it has nothing to do with you or your competence as a dog owner. So Joe and Beth are going to chat with me today about their dogs, about their experience of going through separation anxiety, and I've asked them to share their tips for you to help you navigate your way through this. Hello and welcome to the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. Hi, I'm Julie Naismith, dog trainer, author and full-on separation anxiety geek. I've helped thousands of dogs overcome separation anxiety with my books, my online programs, my trainer certification and my separation anxiety training app. And this podcast is all about sharing my tips and tricks to help you teach your dog how to be happy at home alone too. So Beth, tell us about your dog, the one that has struggled with separation anxiety. Dive in and tell us. Sure. So I have a young dog. His name is Edmund. He is now 11 months. Uh, He's a Llewellyn field bred English setter that I got from a very reputable breeder. And he came to me at nine weeks of age and surprise, surprise, the young man had confinement anxiety. Wow. Okay. Okay. Almost from the off, Beth. Did you notice that immediately? Yeah. The first day was pretty wicked. Um, We tried to crate him just for a few minutes to let him have some puppy downtime. And he began hyperventilating, shrieking, uh, drooling, spinning, clawing. It was, it was pretty intense. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I immediately popped him out, but then the first night was pretty, pretty intense as well. He, he had it right from the jump. Oh, poor baby. And, you know, to be clear, you've you've worked with a lot of dogs and you've had a few dogs yourself. So you, you know what you're dealing with and you know when you see something that's not right. Yes, correct. This was not my first puppy and not my first setter. And this is my second setter with separation anxiety. Um, my first one went through a window. She had separation anxiety so bad um, and has since been resolved. So I knew what I was dealing with and I knew kind of how to get there with him, but it was, it was stunning being a professional and getting this brand new baby puppy who everybody is like, puppies are great right out the jump and they have no issues. (laughs) And it's so wrong. (laughs) So true. And you know, the thing is, um, and I'm sure Joe's going to speak to this as well for so long, we've in a way kind of, yeah, made it not a legitimate concern we've said to people with puppies we said to owners and guardians no 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 don't be silly no just it's a puppy it's just being puppy and and we've completely downplayed their concerns and they're actually in the end for a lot of them they're really good observation that that this wasn't normal puppy stuff which is certainly what you said it sounds like you saw with your youngster yeah, absolutely. It wasn't just a little whining or a little like, oh, I'm I'm sad you've walked away from the crate. It was it was intense and it was pure panic. And yeah. we when we can get into this a little later, but I tried for eight months to get him to crate and we just could never get it conditioned. No, is that your clock in the background? Are we keeping it real with your clock? Yes, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> just, just to prove we are recording this live. But didn't you love that? I love that sound of Beth's clock chiming in the background. It sure beats doorbells. Um, Beth, thanks. We're going to come back on to, uh, we're going to do way more of your story in a second. And I'm just going to dive in and ask Joe the same question. So Joe, tell us all about Reba and her story. Yeah, Reba, she's a cocker bichon. She's um, just had a sixth birthday recently. And I got her as a eight-week-old puppy. So I went to what was a Kennel Club Assured breeder, although it wasn't for this particular breed mix. It was, wasn't was a puppy farm by any stretch, but it was definitely a business because um, there were a few different litters there. So obviously she had quite a busy household that she came from. Um, and yeah, the first, oh gosh, from the first day, the first night, she's my first dog, my first puppy. And I just knew, well, the first few nights were going to be a challenge, but I didn't expect quite what I had. Try to put her into the crate during the day. I've actually, the only photo I've got her in a crate with the door open was literally on her first afternoon with me. Right. Um, and after that, she just drooled, panicked, knocked the water over. It was horrific um, and was at my wit's end. It was so upsetting because I just knew this wasn't right, but I just didn't know where to go at the time. And I'm hoping, and one of the reasons for doing this today is to, you know, is for listeners to realise that sometimes when you know, you just know. And these are two trainers here who are saying that, you know, they both have puppies and they both recognise that, no, 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 this isn't just the normal puppy stuff that people will tell you that's what your puppy's doing. But sometimes you just know. And I, and I personally, I was there as well. I was just like, no, 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 this isn't normal. It really isn't. And you were describing the panic, Joe. just without, I don't want to, I don't want to pe- make people feel really upset, but it is helpful, I think, to understand what panic looks like. So what did you see Reba doing that wasn't just a fussy puppy? Literally, when I went to close the door of the crate, um, because I had a big open plan room, so it wasn't really safe to give her the whole access. Mm -hmm. Um, But she was just trying to get out. I had like a little water bowl on a little ring, so it just held off the ground, but that used to go flying. At one point, she had her head through the ring. She managed to get it off the crate. The clip failed, and it was actually through over her head. Um, the whole bottom of the crate was just wet. And even that was without the water, that was just drooling, howling, panting. Yeah. Just, you can just see the panic. She did not even attempt to settle and it just didn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. You knew something was very wrong there. Oh, the the couple of things you, you you mentioned there was the not stopping. So you know, you you both know this. We often um, when we talk to clients now and they tell us a bit of the history. One of the things that really jumps out is that these dogs are really persistent in the behaviour because they're in a panic, and that panic makes them do whatever they need to do over and over again. And so you see these very persistent behaviours that you just just described, and then that thing about it's. You know, that is way beyond a puppy who just feels like they're missing out on the action or they'd way rather be on the sofa than in the crate. This is a much more fundamental emotion coming out in them, isn't it? Totally. It's, yeah, it, it is more than just a tantrum because I was going to be yeah. with her, touching her the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And And to be clear, I mean, there are some puppies who are, and puppies in particular are very good at expressing their frustration because they haven't learned any impulse control. They don't come programmed with impulse impulse control. So we do meet puppies that just you know, would much rather be in on the action and having fun than be in, the, in their crate. But if you're listening to this and thinking, my puppy sounds like Joe's, my puppy sounds like Beth's, then it may well be that your puppy is anxious. And it may well be that all those people that are telling you that your puppy is just being a normal puppy uh, they don't really know what they're talking about. Anyway, so, um, Joe, thank you. We're going to come back and talk about Reva in, in a bit more, but um, back to Beth. So, Beth, you discovered that Gorgeous Evan is now panicking in his crate. So, what did you do? What are your next steps? So, I did something really unconventional, which um, a bunch of my colleagues looked at me sideways, and certainly <laughs> a bunch of pet parents did too. I got him out of his crate. As a nine week old puppy, 
I went, well, that's not worth it to me for you to sit there in a blind panic. It would be the same if you put me in a room with a thousand spiders, I would be in a blind panic. And so there was no sense just creating that distrust for him in humans that we're just going to lock him away and not care about his emotional state. So I got him out of the grate. He couldn't even be in an X-Pen. So that was even a little more challenging. Um, I created a safe space for him down in our foyer, which I just lined the foyer with X-Pen so that he couldn't chew the walls. And I left him with my senior setter, who is now resolved for Seth Banks. And that worked to be able to leave him alone if we had to for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. But he could not be crated. And I stepped all the way back to the very beginning, making positive associations mm-hmm. with crate. I tried and tried and tried and tried. We tried every yeah. night to crate him. Um, he would make it about 30 minutes and then start whimpering and whining, which if you didn't immediately respond to him, which a couple of my colleagues said, oh, he's just learned that when he whines and whimpers, you get him out. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, but... If I leave him, he escalates and he doesn't just escalate to the point of I'm barking out of getting your attention. I am barking out of a sheer emotion and I'm panicking and he's drooling and then he would soil himself. So we gave up at five months, the crating at night. And the first night my husband's like, we're going to lose everything. We're going to lose the walls. We're going to lose wires. I will honestly tell you, we've never lost a single thing. And the very first night, five months in, was the first night we all slept completely through the night. He curled up on a dog bed on the on the floor and went right to sleep. I continue to try to create train, and it's just not something he's willing to do. I think yeah. he may be a dog that's claustrophobic, and that's fine. So I the only thing we're working on now that he has some issues with is he does not like to be left in a car. So if you leave him in a car and try to walk away, he, he panics. So we're working on some habituation and desensitization there. Um, but again, it's a very slow process. Yeah. Yeah. And it often can be right. We yeah. know that we know that. And it's sometimes it, it is easy when it's not your own dog. It is way more stressful. You've got all the tensions, you've got the family tensions. And there's also a little bit of you that thinks, I mean, I certainly did, you know, well, shouldn't I know better? Shouldn't, why is this happening to me? But I want to just couple, come back on a couple of things that you said. So you started off by saying, um, I did some things that you might find surprising. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what is Beth going to say? <laughs> What's she going to tell me that we haven't talked about? And you talked about not creating. And now, and from where I am and where Joe is and the further kind of east we go into parts of Europe, crating isn't a thing. I mean, it's become more normal in, in the UK now, Joe, hasn't it, that we crate puppies in order to help with house training and, and chewing. But there are lots of countries in the world, lots of countries in Europe in particular, where crates aren't used to house train. They're not used to chew train. I didn't do it with either of my two younger dogs, old, older dogs now. It just didn't occur to me. Uh, you know, I did what lots of people do. I created a smaller space that we would be in together, watch them like a hawk. And yeah, we lost a few things. I'm not going to lie. We lost a few, you know, backs of backs, the heels of shoes and, you know, a couple of chair legs had chomps in them. But it was not something that I think in the UK at that time you felt compelled to do so it wouldn't seem like you were failing if you don't didn't create but i do come across lots of guardians and owners in this part of the world in north america now who feel like they're failing if they don't create but there are way, many many ways to house train and chew train a puppy without having to use a crate having said that i love crates for reasons if we can get the puppy to love a crate so i'm kind of kind of mixed on that um and then there was something else you said and it's completely gone out of my head but we will come back to it but i joe i want to ask you about crating because obviously now you work with lots of clients what's the what's the stance in the uk on crates at the moment it's still very typical you know you get told the dog needs a safe area a, yeah. a pen um a den all dogs love a den that's why crates put a blanket over the top and I think for the house training, it's probably 99% of clients do crate training. Right. Okay, um, that's interesting. Because that's not the case if you went somewhere like Sweden, for example. In Scandinavian com- countries, they, 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 they train house trained dogs, but I'm making a broad generalization here, which a listener might pick me up on. But they don't tend to be as 100% crate focused, I don't think. Yeah, and I think we need to be a bit more open, but then maybe... People are very precious about the houses and the floors and, you know, the dirt that dog might bring in. And the last thing they want is the 
pee and poo accidents, yeah. which are going to happen anyway with a puppy because yep. um, is even if you're trying to watch them 24-7, you sometimes lose your concentration for yeah. a minute and that's the one minute where they're going to have an accident. So, yeah, I think that there's definitely crates do not suit every dog and I, I wish I'd known that at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and you can, it's like pushing water uphill with a dog who doesn't want to love a crate. We've got, you know, lovely incremental crate training plans that are designed to get dogs to love crates, but there's just something with some dogs, as soon as that door closes, it seems like you can never get past that step or the other step where I find that these dogs really um, struggle on is as soon as you go out of sight and they're in a crate. Um, But it's great to hear both of you talk about alternatives that, yes, you can house train and chew train a puppy, even if you don't have a crate. So you obviously gave up on the crating then as well, Joe. Yeah, so I didn't really know where to turn when I realised I obviously had a problem. And my vets, very, very good vets, but this obviously wasn't a specialist topic. And I got sent away with some Google printouts about leave her to cry it out, don't come back when they're crying keep her in the crate, at least go out every day for at least 20 minutes leaving her. So this was my first foray into separation training, which obviously didn't work. Um, we had probably about eight months of no sleep. My neighbours, I don't think, slept either. Oh. Um, and in the end, as soon as I knew that Reba was toilet trained and was going to be safe, she was given the, the run of the room downstairs. I still was trying to keep her downstairs because my bedroom is my sanctuary, mm-hmm. only because I used to have a cat and I was allergic to the cats. So that's why I didn't want pets in my bedroom, because um, it was my safe zone. Um, as soon as I let Reba out to sleep on the little chair in the kitchen, she was absolutely really good for about a week. So I think there were some foxes in the garden. And then she's now upstairs in my bedroom on her own dog bed. And I have to kick her awake in the morning. Well, not literally kick her, but you know. <laughs> no, no, I know what you're saying. I need to wake her up. She sleeps so well now. <sighs> oh, it's lovely when they get to that stage because... Well, as an aside, I think most of us have seen that in our own dogs and in client dogs, that one of the things that they they definitely, we see a change in dogs who get over separation anxiety is that they start to settle much better, don't they? Because they're not on high alert all the time that we're about to walk out of the door and the sky's about to fall on their heads. So, um, well, that's lovely. And, and, and obviously lots of progress made with her. But what I was just going to go back to what you said earlier about the advice you were given. So it wasn't awful. It wasn't for the most part, just, you know, lock her up, forget about it and she'll get over it. It was, you know, practice separation, go out for a certain amount of time. But but the way that we all work now is very different to that, isn't it? Because it's much more precise and usually it's much smaller chunks of time because we're fine with these panicky dogs. A minute is a long time for them, right? Oh, yeah. I was initially told you've got to leave it for at least 20 minutes to half an hour every day. Um I was just starting up my business, so I was home all the time. And my vet was saying, no, you shouldn't be at home with her all the time. Just leave her to, you know, she'll stop crying eventually. She'll get used to it. So it was quite harsh. And I could hear her from outside the house. And it, I was crying in my car. Um, oh, Joe. You know, and I, it made her worse to what she was. And then my persistence of the crate training made her work. She's still phobic about going in crates. She won't go into a small space. She won't go Mm. behind the door Mm. to get a toy. So I still have issues there. But I started introducing, obviously I was introducing her to absences, but starting at 20 minutes, I would never encourage that now. Um, It was too big a chunk of time, but I didn't know better at the time. time, And I trusted my vets and um, I trusted my medical issues now. Yeah, well, the 20 minutes is interesting because we do hear it a lot, 15, 20, or I'll hear, you know, you leave them for one and then it's five and then it's 10. And just honestly, we just don't see dogs like that. They, If they panic, they panic. And they usually panic very quickly when we first start working with them, don't they? Um, And that something you just said there just reminded me of something that Beth said that I wanted to come back to. So Beth, one of the things you said was that you were, um, maybe a couple of people have said to you, um, when he's in his crate and he whines and you let him out, he's just learning that when he whines, he gets out. And you said, no, mm, maybe. But the thing is, and I would come back on whoever said that to you and say, but if he's whining because he's about to go into a panic, then 
then yeah, we need to let him out. So whether he's learning that whining, um, you know, gets him out or not, if he learns that whining gets him out as he's about to go into a panic, then fair dues, you know, fair, fair enough him letting us know he's about to go into panic, right? Yeah, absolutely. But why, if I know that that snake four yards in front of me is going to send me into a panic, why would I keep walking forward towards that snake? I'm I'm not going to. So it's interesting that, that there is a school of thought that we should disregard emotion and that pet parents often think that the dog is just being stubborn or the dog is, is just, oh, it's not used to being in the crate. So it's making noise. No, you know, if you've ever seen a dog that is comfortable in a crate, they go in, they curl up, they lie down. Maybe they'll give a little whimper here and there, but they're not going to shriek. And Edmund was pure on shrieking. Like it would raise the hair on the back of your neck to listen Mm. to him scream. And it was just, it was not worth it. Um, I will say that my husband and I um, had a little bit of disagreement in the beginning and that I four of the five months that we tried to get him to sleep in his crate, which I will tell you, we did not sleep for five months through the night. So we were very sleep deprived. (laughs) He wanted to keep going. And I kept saying, no, we need to let him out. No, we, in my professional opinion. And then I had him talk to a couple of my colleagues that specialize in separation anxiety too. And I'm like, here, they'll tell you too. And he's like, you just told them to tell me. And I'm like, (laughs) I I swear I did it. They, we need to get the dog out because it's not helping him. It, he's, it's not changing his opinion about the crate, just keeping him in there. Just like keeping me in the room with the snake isn't going to change my opinion about it. So let's, let's get him out and let's see if that makes it better. And let's see if then he sleeps through the night and then we can work on conditioning it. If you're insistent that we need to have a crate, because of course, you know, I've heard the argument, you need crates in emergencies. You need crates. You know, if there's a fire, you need crates. If there's whatever, a vet office. And I'm like, in all honesty, if I have to send my dog to a vet for an emergency, sedate him. Yeah. You know, that's, I, I have no problem with it. If he's there for an emergency already, just sedate him because that's going to make it easier on everybody. And all of these reasons why we have to crate train and I'm not against crate training. No, no, none of us are. I mean, no. yeah, I can't count the number of crates in my house. It's about six at the last count, but you know, that's for different dogs for different reasons. No, I, I completely agree. Right. It's just that feeling that every dog should crate train. And especially in the States, it's you have to crate train. It is an absolute necessity. And for, for Edmund and with that emotion, it made it so much better. As soon as we took him out, he was fine. And now he can be behind a gate. Like I can put him in the foyer behind a gate and he's fine, but he just cannot be in, in a crate. And why, why continue to push that water up the hill that was not working and it wasn't working for him and it was making him miserable. And he wouldn't come into our bedroom after a while. He'd be like, Nope, that's where the crate is. And I'm not going in there because that's where that devil box is. And I'm uncomfortable in there. And yet you put me in there every single night and we would do it with chicken. And he would like go in, get the chicken and dart out because he couldn't get the gate closed fast enough. So Sorry, a bit of a ramble there. No, really interesting stuff to unpack there as well because it's true. They can crates can be incredibly useful. I feel like we're we're just having a conversation about crates now. Maybe we should do a whole other episode just on crates, just to chat on crates. But but it's equally if it's that difficult, there's always different ways around it. I totally agree. If if a dog is that stressed out at the groomers or the vets that they can't be created, let's sedate them anyway. Um, the point about dogs who in, who can now be behind gates, that's certainly the, the case in our house is, you know, Percy can happily sit behind a gate or behind a closed door now. Just crating was just that much harder. But um, yeah, great, great points you're making about there are other ways of doing this. And if it becomes so difficult that I mean, you were you were losing you were losing sleep for how many months? Five months, did you say? Nobody can sustain that. That's just oh, five months, and it was we were sleep deprived. And I was, you know, I'm a behavior consultant, and I work about fifty clients a week. I was exhausted. Yeah. I was short tempered. I was ill tempered with my husband. Him and I were not getting along. And there were points where we wanted to squash him like a bug because it was really tough to deal with this very opinionated drivey little puppy who he wasn't getting enough sleep. And if anyone knows what a puppy is like with not enough sleep, it was awful. He was hyper aroused. He was over threshold all the time in all aspects of his life. And as soon as I stopped that, his entire personality changed. He settled. He was able to get an off switch. 
And I was doing all the right things outside of the creating enrichment, exercise, you know, mental games, every, all these things that my field bred setter puppy needed, but it wasn't enough because yeah. he couldn't sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so important for everybody, everybody in the house. Um, so Joe, um, you get Rebra Evercrate, but the problems didn't stop there, right? Because we've got, um, we've also got separation issues with, with uh, Reba, which you mentioned and which you started work on. When did you think this stuff's not working? I need to find another way of doing this. Like Beth, I was so sleep deprived. I don't remember the, my first year with Reba. I was like a zombie. My vet was actually more worried about me than the dog. It, it took a while, probably about a year. It took a while. And I was, I was training to be a trainer. So I wasn't, I was dog walking at the time. So actually I wasn't, I was very flexible with being out the house and not being out the house very often because I was very slowly building up my business. So I just gradually built up the time. But like I say, it was very chunky, but it was quite haphazard. There, there was no system to it. I didn't make a record of what I was doing. It just almost went with my gut feeling that, oh, I had a camera on her. Oh, good. Um, good. I could see she was a little bit upset, but I wasn't like rushing back. I was like, okay, I'll, I've got another five minutes. So she'd be like, I, if she cries for five minutes, that's better than crying for the whole time. Yes. But I wasn't leaving very much. I was very much housebound. Um, but that was the commitment I was prepared to make. But then it suited because my business was literally just starting up. So I wasn't that busy at the time anyway. I was doing a lot of study, which I could do at home. But she's also very hyper attached. And I was told that's because I was home a lot. So it's kind of like a double edged sword, really. But for me, it worked. And like I said, I wish I'd knew, known earlier how to do it a bit more systematically and a bit more slowly. Yep. I mean, just, just train with a plan as you do now, track your progress as you do for all yeah. your clients now. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting one as well about the. You know, we ask everybody to find a way for someone to be with their dog. Uh, and because when they have dog has separation anxiety, we want to, you know, as Beth was talking about the exposure to the snake, we want to stop the exposure to the scary thing, the alone time. Um, and you make a really good point there. You know, we ask people to do that, but then they end up spending more time with their dogs sometimes, depending on what care structure they've kind of implemented. So does that make it worse? And yeah, there's, there is a risk that, you know, if we say so, suddenly you must spend all of your time with your dog, there is a risk that that hyper attachment develops or grows. But the alternative of just leave this dog to panic and the impact that can have on a dog's brain, short term and long term, that's a way uh, bigger risk and a way bigger harm, a potential harm. Because we can work on hyper attachment. And in fact, you, both of you, I'm sure, have seen it with clients that resolves quicker in most dogs than does the pure um, isolation distress. But yeah, it's always a potential that a dog will go, okay, fine, great, mum's home all the time. So as soon as you go anywhere, they can't be with anybody else now. Um, oh, Edmund is hyper attached. He my is. husband. Yep. Interesting. He spent a lot more time with my husband, especially the first week that we got him. I was in a client's house doing a board and train. So he spent the entire first week with him, pretty much just him and Edmund and our other four creatures. But uh, so there was a lot of those two bonding. And now as we've been doing training and as he's growing, Richard's been taking kind of a lead on it because I can get very tired wanting to come home and train my own dogs after a day of training everyone else's dogs. So Richard's been doing a lot of the training and a lot of the work on Edmund. And when we do uh, reactive dog programs, he's our neutral dog and Richard handles him. So they have a really nice bond. But what that created is it created his inability to be away from Richard. So it is, it was, we're, we're, we've made some really nice progress on yeah. it. It was to the point where if I took Richard from Edmund when, or other way around, if I, or maybe it was, if I took Richard from uh, yeah. Edmund, <laughs> um, even when we were out at a session and I tried to walk away from Richard with Edmund, he would just smooth flip. Like he would scream, he would hyperventilate, he would um, claw at me, he would pull at my shirt, he would he would leap at me, and he would just spin back to try to get back to Richard because Richard was his person. 
Yeah. And if Richard left the house, that was game. I have a video of him on my TikTok of his just pure panic with Richard leaving the house to like go get a cup of coffee or something. Mm-hmm. And it he just lost it. Mm-hmm. And so we had to build really slowly, um, shifting Richard away from all the care and mm-hmm. me doing more of the work with him and building more of a bond with him. And then what we also did, because then sometimes what can happen and what happened with him is then he was like, oh, I'll just hyper attach to you now. Yes. Like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. So we had to actually bring in some pet sitters and some colleagues and have them come in and do some work with Edmund and have them like alleviate us during the week and take him for walks and go to daycare and stuff like that. Because Edmund was just shifting yes. too quickly. Like he'd shift to me and then he'd shift back to Richard. So he's, he's a very interesting character, this guy. Well, what's fascinating there is you showed that the process works, but it works too well sometimes. <laughs> yes, it really does. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, so when a dog is, it's not just about, when the dog isn't just struggling with being alone, but they're struggling being apart from a person. In Edmund's case, it was one person. Um, we call it hyperattachment. It's just kind of an um, an unhealthy attachment. Unhealthy because it impacts the dog and it can impact the, the guardian or the owner. But the way that we work on that is we get other people in the dog's life to step up and do more fun stuff, do more bonding stuff. You know, remembering that, you know, we didn't give birth to these puppies. So the attachment that they form with us in the first place is to a degree unnatural. So we can transfer that. But a great example from Beth there that sometimes dogs just seem to be serial attachers, don't they? I love you so much. And now, oh, no, now I love you so much. But great job of getting other people involved to really spread that love so lovely story there i just want to finish off we've got a few more minutes but i'd really like to finish off with uh, you giving some advice to um, our listeners and the first thing I'd, i'd love to hear from you is you know thinking back to all that you've been through the challenges that you face with your dogs what's the number one kind of feeling or experience that you'd like to share with them that maybe they've been going through the same experience too I think for me, it's, I felt like I was the only one because I didn't know where to turn and I didn't know what it was and it was quite daunting. So I think the um, the one key thing is to let owners know that you're not alone. Yes. There is the right support out there and actually this affects way more dogs than anyone ever realizes saw some research recently and it's quite scary numbers just how many dogs actually have separation anxiety and probably about half the owners either don't realize or can't be bothered to deal with it so if you are that's a massive massive step in the right direction but it's a long haul I mean I'm six years down the line I can leave my girl home alone three to four hours comfortably now Yay. during the daytime she can't really be left anywhere else I can't even go to the toilet in my mum's house even though we yeah. go there once a month um but she has got a best dog friend with um one of my ex-client dog walking clients that um really burn by when they love each other and she will spend overnight um there Byron is down the utility room but Reba's up in their bed on the bed oh so she gets <laughs> absolutely pampered she whines for apparently first five ten minutes and then she's quite easily distracted by byron's toys because all other dogs toys are new toys for her right um so yeah so it's it's a long journey it's not just over in a couple of months it probably would have been a quicker journey had i known what i was doing sooner but for us it works it built up slowly it's a long journey but you're not on your own but it can be very isolating yes. for humans when you have a separation anxiety dog. It feels like the isolation kind of gets layered on because you've got, you do feel like you even now, you know, in this day and age where we, you know, we're all connected online. I, I hear it time and time again, people feeling like they're the only person that's got a dog like this. And then they suddenly discover, you know, the, the big free Facebook group that we've got. Um, and there's, you know, 45,000 people in there all, you're talking about separation anxiety and suddenly people go, oh, well, I really thought I was the only one. And Joe, you made such a good point. There are way more dogs out there with this 
There are some people who don't know, don't know that about their dog or they don't want to admit it. And so the ones that do know and the ones that are working on it can feel isolated because they've got people in their immediate circle or in their friends and family saying, well, my dog doesn't have this. So what's going on with your dog? So that isolation, not only are you staying at home to be with your dog so your dog doesn't panic, you then feel um, emotionally isolated because you think I'm the only person dealing with this, which is kind of the reason why I started doing this whole thing in the first place 10 years ago. So I was like, we cannot be the only people going through this. This is ridiculous. Uh, you also talked about how Reba kind of hasn't taken her newfound confidence on the road. And we know, don't we, that's that's pretty standard that these dogs uh, gen- don't generalize their confidence. They're really good at generalizing their fear, but they tend to have to learn the confidence whether it's being home alone or whether it's confidence around people they don't know, they tend to have to learn them in different setups in different contexts. So that's really common, isn't it? Reba not being able to be left anywhere else yet is quite typical for these dogs, right? Absolutely. But for me, the most important thing was because it is just me and her at home. And as much as I love her, I needed to go out. I needed to go and see clients. And I sat up a training class and needed to be able to go out. So the most important thing for me was for me to be able to leave her home alone yes. and for her to be left in other places is was lower down the list. Yeah. It wasn't as important being able to have a friend that can take her. Um, they take them for up to two nights. They won't do a whole week. I don't get a week's holiday. <laughs> I can get a long weekend, but that for me is okay. Well, that's fine. I can relax. I know she's enjoying herself, but to be honest, my days of probably long holidays, uh, maybe over for a bit, but that, that's just the way I'm quite happy to accept this. And, you know, I hope I've had some fantastic long holidays, like for a couple of months long holidays in the past. So for me, this is just my, my new normal and spending the time with her, but knowing that I can go out seeing clients, running my business, that for me was the most important priority. Yeah, I like that you say that because often we are, trying to get people to prioritize because you that the training takes time it takes a lot of invested time but it can also take a lot of elapsed time you know the, the period of, of time that it takes to get these dogs to recover so we're often saying aren't we well what's your priority is your priority to be able to leave your dog in any hotel room you go to or would you like to get four hours your dog to be comfortable for four hours in your own home so you can go and do your stuff and most people will say yeah do you know what just home is fine um, so it's great that you highlighted the fact that we do ask people to prioritize. Joe, thank you. Um, Beth, same question to you. So what, what's your, you know, what feeling or experience do you think that you could um, share with us of your um, time with Ed, Edmund, your experience with Edmund that you think people would resonate with? Yeah, I think the very first thing is you didn't do anything wrong. Yes. yes. Your, yeah, your puppy came this way. I can remember our third night and me sitting on the floor in front of the crate. I had gone home uh, and tried to relieve my husband for a few hours. And I sat in front of the crate crying and thought, what did I do to create this? And how did I do that in three days? (laughs) Um, Most people think a puppy can't be broken or, or that there's nothing wrong with a puppy coming straight out of, you know, from the mom. But genetics plays such a big part in what we get with our dog Mm -hmm. and come to find out that the grand dam of Edmund um, has separation related behaviors and is a very anxious dog and they could never create her. Uh, Of the 11 puppies, Edmund is the only one with separation related behaviors, but just because they skipped a generation and skipped 11 other 10 other puppies doesn't mean that I created this, right? It means that he had a predisposition to having something in his genetics that said, this isn't for me. And don't give up. I mean, there were days when I wanted to squash him like a bug or send him back to his breeder um, or tie him to a tree out front. But But, by the way, can we just be clear? Beth is a hundred percent force-free trainer. So she's (laughs) being honest about the feelings that you know, they push our buttons. It's like with kids, you know, people love their kids to bits and it doesn't mean so there aren't days when they just go, Rawr! it's they these things that we adore, they push, push our buttons in a way that we can never imagine. 
Yeah. If you don't ever say that you don't, you want to squash your puppy like a bug, you're lying. Like they make them so cute so that you won't squish And that you don't do it right. (laughs) But I mean, he is, you can see there's proof of life all over my Instagram. He's fine. He's a lovely dude. And I am thankful for him every day. I'm also very thankful that I got him because it made me build some empathy for my own clients. Because I hadn't raised a puppy in 16 years. And so when I got my first puppy in 16 years and he was maladaptive, I was like, oh, goodness, I can't imagine what someone whose very first puppy they're getting. And it's like this is putting them through. Yeah. So it built a bunch more empathy in me and made me realize how if I'm struggling this much, so are my clients. And my, my clients don't have the knowledge that I have. And I was to the point that I didn't know what to do. So I even called in a pro. I called in a separation anxiety pro to help me set out a plan for him because I needed more clear eyes on it. So more than anything, seek out a professional. And and it's okay to tell your professional that you're frustrated and you hate your puppy because there are days that I presented him because I was exhausted I didn't have the normal, lovely kid that I thought I was going to get. And it is okay to feel that way. Yeah. It's that whole thing, isn't it? About we, um, you know, all of us are in this for the long run. It's also okay to, in a way, kind of grieve the puppy or dog that you imagined you would get and you didn't have. And that's not being, that's just being human. That's just being normal, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent normal. And I think so many people are so afraid to talk about that part of it, right? They don't want to be like, oh, I'm a monster because my puppy drives me crazy. You'd be a Stepford wife if your puppy yeah. didn't drive you crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, we often hear parents say this. I love my kids, but some days I hate being a parent. You know, I, I, I love my puppy to bits, but some days I hate being guardian or pet parent because it's today it's really tough. I love him, but today it is really tough. Um, and that's, that's, that's just normal. It would be weird if we didn't feel like that at times. So um, um, anybody got any final words of wisdom as we go? Any like, you know, if you only could only do one thing, if you could only give people one piece of advice, what would that be? Just one thing. Don't Tough let question. them try it out. Yay. I'm glad you say that. Joey, you're going to say that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we could only change that one thing in the life of the puppy, then I think we'd all, well, we might all end up seeing far few cases, actually. I think that could be a big game changer. If only people would just stop that horrible method. Listen, both of you, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience, but also to um, make it real and make people realize that it's not just them and for you to share your, your wisdom about how people can move forward with this. So appreciate your time so much. And obviously, if people want to work with either of you, they can find you via my Find the Trainer site. So thank you, Beth. Thank you, Joe. And uh, yeah, keep us all posted on that puppy journey, Beth, won't you? I will for sure. Thank you for having me, Julie. Thanks, Joe. And thank you, Julie. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. If you want to find out more about how I can help you further, head over to julienaysmith.com. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed listening today, I would love it if you would head over to wherever you listen to your podcasts and consider rating my show. Thanks so much. Good luck with that training and bye for now.